All right, so I will do just a little uh, overview of the company plus the media products, the media products that are aimed at the uh, meta switch integration. So we are located uh, near Montreal in Canada. We manufacture uh, carrier grade products or all our products are installed in the central offices. Uh, the main products we have is the media gateways that we call TMGs. It's Telco Bridges Media Gateways, which are general uh, naming convention for all the media gateways. Then we have the signaling gateways, which are uh, TSGs. And we have another segment, which is called Pro SVC. We, which we will not talk about in this presentation. Um, we were funded in 2002. We're, like I said, at quarters near Montreal, and we manufacture all the hardware, software, uh, research, development. It's all done here in the, our headquarters. But we do have uh, sales personnel outside and also technical support uh, from uh, Turkey, Colombia, and uh, Joshua is based in, in Vietnam. So we can cover uh, all regions of the world with this team. So we are deployed in, in more than 100 countries. I think the latest number was 120. So we have uh, stuff installed uh, in Korea, China, Malaysia, uh, France, uh, well, all around the world. Latest ones are, of course, uh, the big ones we had, Hong Kong Telecom, replaced a lot of equipment over there, and also uh, Marketel in, in Mexico and uh, different, the different regions of the world. All right. So today you will be present. We will be presenting here. Uh, today it's going to be mostly me that will talk, but uh, I assure you, in the next days, uh, Joshua will uh, assist me here. He's a, a master of all the uh, settings of the system and configurations and everything. So let's start with our uh, team media products. We call them also network transformation devices because we are uh, replacing all the equipments to get to the new networks. So uh, it's, it's really important to, uh, to do this in a lot of networks. Equipments are getting older. Uh, for us, these are new devices that we, uh, that we have here, okay? So here I'm presenting the different types of uh, models we have for the T-Media devices. So I just start here to give you a, an overview of these products. So these are all media gateways, as you can see here, all one new. They look very similar one, uh, one and the other. Uh, however, it's the type of TDM interconnection that will give you the choice of the devices. Here we have different type of TDM interfaces, either uh, T1 for uh, North America uh, and some other places in the world, but mostly E1 for the rest of the world. And you can have on the TMG800 up to 16 uh, E1, T1 or E1 available. And on the TMG3200 TE, you will have 16 to 64 uh, T1s available. And you see there's a little different on the type of connectors here, and I will show you that a bit later. You then here have the DS3 model, DS3 model, which has one, two, three interfaces here. All right, so the, uh, you can see the different connectors compared to the other ones. Then you have the, uh, here I call the OC3 version, but it's actually OC3 or STM1. Again, the OC3 is mostly North America. STM1 is mostly the uh, rest of the world. And here you have a one plus one architecture for um, the OC3. So you have one main port and one uh, protection port, okay? You see here the interfaces Okay, so you have some, some interfaces, uh, a number of interfaces that can be used for voice over IP, interconnect, and also uh, management. Okay, so I will show you that as well. So here you have the TMG7800. Uh, this is a larger system, which has the same capabilities as the other devices. 
they are viewed, uh, the system is viewed as one, one large system. So when you uh, want to con con configure the system and control it, manage it, it's, it's viewed as one system. So here you have additional uh, devices to uh, create the system. But then after this, for per one U, you have uh, a number of E1s or DS3 or OC3. So it's sort of a, an assembly of the other devices that we have. And it creates a fully non-blocking architecture of uh, up to 16 devices. So that gives you, uh, in total, up to 1,024 T1 or E1, uh, up to 43, F38 DS3 interfaces. Also, this is also in the North America. And then uh, 16 OC3 or STM1. So uh, the TMG7800, like I said, can be a combination of these devices. So you could have some, for example, OC3 in the system and some T1s in the system at the same time. So it can be a combination of both. And then you can switch calls coming in the OC3 to T1 lines and vice versa. Okay. And it can be a combination of any of these types. Uh, so like I said, you can have up to 16 of those devices in the system. Uh, you have two controllers uh, that will have the H248 interface towards the meta switch. And then you have two uh, sp special devices from Tech Bridges, uh, we call TMS, T-Media switches. And uh, this will transport media between the devices non-blocking, okay? So if you have calls coming in, one of the devices, let's say one of the STM, uh, STM1 or OC3 here, you will be able to switch it out either TDM again or switch it out IP on this side. Right? And the media will pass through uh, the system. The TMIA switch is a, it's a low delay function. So there's, a, there's a no, no difference switching between devices than in the same device. And then of course you have multiple internet interfaces to interconnect this into the system. Okay. Then we have the signaling gateway. So uh, let's say we focus on this model now, TSG 800 because it has already 16 T1E1 device, which is a lot for a signaling gateway. And not only it has 16 T1 here, you have also 64 MPP toolings, which you can bring into this device and convert that to any type of, of SIGTRAN links, one-to-one uh, -one if you want. And then uh, it's the M2UA that we want to use with the MetaSwitch interface. Okay. So we will relay uh, SS7 MTP2 links coming in T1 or E1 up to the meta switch using M2PA interconnection. Here again, you have multiple Ethernet ports, so you can configure uh, different VLANs, you can configure different IP addresses on the systems, and it's, it makes it very flexible. It doesn't have to be only one-to-one -one also. This can serve multiple devices inside the same unit. Okay, so you can, you can have a single gateway to multiple meta switch units. So I will be talking about the, the media gateways uh, in these presentations, but not the TMG7800. Uh, if we want, we can talk about that in another uh, presentation. We will be talking also on the signaling gateway, the TSG800 device. So what does it look like if we start with the T-Media signaling relay? So what we have here is a media gateway controller. So this will be uh, the MetaSwitch CFS. Okay. This MetaSwitch CFS will reside here. And the CFS, of course, doesn't have any TDM uh, interfaces. So the only way you can reach the device is with an IP link here, and that's what we're doing with SIGTRAN and the preferred choice for meta switches using M2 UA. Right. So what we do here is we interconnect TDM uh, interfaces. So these could be uh, here T1, uh, E1 links here to the TDM network. These uh, MTP2 links here are usually 64 kilobit per second links that come in the TDM network. 
with inside signaling information. So you get signaling information inside those T1, E1. And then this gets converted to M2UA. So it gets uh, packetized into M2UA messages. And as a, let's say a general rule, uh, the M2UA configuration is the IP uh, of the destination here, the IP of the source here, and it knows then how to uh, packetize these uh, signaling information into M2UA packets, and the media gateway controller can decode those signaling messages. The advantage of doing it at this level is, if, if, as you see it, you stay at the layer two, so then you don't need to configure uh, higher level information inside the signaling gateway, all right? So there's uh, only the information about the M2 TP2 link and m 2 ua SIGTRAN information. The CFS will manage the point codes and will manage the ISOP messages or the SCCP messages. They will all be at this level here at the media gateway control. So the configuration here at the uh, signaling gateway is very simple, as you will see in the uh, further presentation we'll give this week. And uh, it's, it's also quite easy to make sure that this link is working perfectly. So of course here, since we are a TDM, we need to be connected uh, with, with a, a cable. But here on this side, it's an IP link. So it can be uh, the meta switch uh, media gateway controller can be much further in the network or anywhere in the network. Okay? So normally these are co-located with the TDM network so that we try to keep those uh, T1 links uh, as short as possible. Uh, but the IP link of course can be much further. Then we go to the media gateway. So in an environment like this, the media gateway is controlled by the media gateway controller. So what we do here is we have, again, this is uh, an IP network on this side, and we have a, a protocol that we use to interconnect between the two devices. So we use H.248, which is an ITU specification. And the media gateway controller will prepare messages and send them to the media gateway here. Media gateway can decode the messages and uh, process what is requested by the media gateway controller. And then it will reply to the media gateway controller, yes, I was successful or, or no, I can't do this. Okay? And these types of commands can be connect a uh, channel here on the TDM side to a channel here on the RTP side. What is a channel here? Again, this is a 64 kilobit per second voice channel that you have here on this side. Uh, the 64 kilobit per second channel can be in any one of those interfaces here. It doesn't matter. Uh, even if it's an OC3 interface, the, we can switch in each and every one of those uh, time slots. When we switch those time slots, they are being converted to an RTP stream. So of course, an RTP stream here, you will have an IP address to know where to send the packet. And you will have also the RTP port that will be dynamic. So for every call that we do here, the RTP port is generated and that's how we know how to send this data. The other thing we will do here is to uh, create a, a packetization on RTP. So the most popular one of course is G711. So that's what we will packetize it here. But there's other vocoders that we have and I will show you that uh, just a bit later. Again, on the other side, will we just capture the RTP? create 64 kilobit per second stream to be able to send to the TDM network. So let's say this is the uh, basic function of H248, but you have also other commands that the MGC can send here. For example, play something to the user here, play something to the user here. 
you could also have uh, create a conference. So you could have multiple users uh, being brought into a conference here. You can have also um, uh, tone detection. So for example, if there's a tone that is sent here, it can be relayed to the media gateway controller and it can do some actions according to the tones detected. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of other functions uh, that we, we can do here. Then the, uh, these devices can also do uh, signaling gateways. So here we have the same H248 interface we had before with the RTP and the TDM, but we can add to the same system those signaling uh, links. So you can have your MTP2 links here coming into the devices and being sent to the uh, media gateway controller using M2UA. All right, so these are two separate paths in the system. One will be this path here, and one will be this path here. Okay. Whoops. One will be this path here, like this. So signaling being sent and received from the media gateway controller. And the second path will be H248, making connections between RTP and EDM like this. All right, so it's in, in the same device, but two separate functions that you configure. Uh, I didn't show this before, but of course the messages that will come in here will be uh, eyes up messages, SS7 eyes up messages. So this controls TDM uh, links at this level here or TDM uh, media streams at this level here. And then you can, uh, the media controller will send the SIP messages on the uh, IP network. And the SIP messages, of course, then control these RTP channels here. All right, so this is a combination of media gateway and signal. In addition to this, we also support the IUA mode. So the IUA mode is a, a SIGTRAN protocol. It's, so it's a user adaptation for ISDN PRI. So ISDN PRI is a, a 30 B channel plus one D channel. Okay, so you have here the signaling and the media on the same uh, interface, same uh, T1 or E1. And this is relayed, the signaling is relayed to the media get gateway controller, but the media is relayed to RTP here. All right, so it comes into the same uh, T1, but then it's uh, being relayed, the media is being relayed end to end. And just, uh, yeah, so I haven't been specific on this. So for E1, it will be uh, 30 channels, 30 voice channel plus one D channel which will be actually the time slot 16 here. Okay, so you'll have one D channel and 30 uh, voice channel, but for, for T1, well, you have only 24, right? So you'll have tw 23 media channel plus one D channel, which will be the last time slot. And when I say channels here, it's all 64 kilobit per second channel. Uh, here I'm showing only T1 and E1. However, it would support all the modes here. So you could have IUA coming in uh, OC3 or other type of interfaces. And of course, this can be uh, put on the same system as the uh, M2UA relay. So you could have M2UA relay, TDM relay, media relay here, IUA all on the same device. So if I just uh, repeat what I said here, TSG 800, well, it's a one new device. It supports SSFN protocol only. Uh, on the SIGTRAN side, it supports M2PA, M2UA, and M3UA. However, we uh, usually use M2UA with uh, Metaswitch. It does not have uh, media on these devices. 
It is controlled through a, a web-based interface. Uh, you have command line interface, you have the RESTful API you can use, which we'll, we'll show you later, and also SNMP. So we'll explain all these tools that you have later. Uh, and it supports all of this. And then for troubleshooting, we have a signaling capture we can take. So we can see the TDM side of the signaling, and you can see the M2UA side of the signaling. Uh, both of them can be put in a Wireshark uh, interface, so it's very, very convenient to uh, see what is going on here. On the media gateway side, we have uh, still a 1U, and then you support all these kinds of protocols. So I talked about SS7 and ISDN PRI. I did not talk about CAS and V5.2, but they're also supported on these devices. Um, and here, of course, on the IP side and SIGTRAN protocols, we show, we see that we support M2UA and IUA, but we also support other types of protocols. And of course, the H248, which allows us to interconnect with the media gateway control. The media and TDM and media and RTP is supported, and you have the same type of interfaces to access the system, configure it, change the configuration, get the SNMP traps, so you have all of this. In the troubleshooting section, you, we've integrated the MetaSwitch SAS, so we can then send the SAS messages to the server to link a specific call to a specific media on the device. So for example, if the media gateway controller asks to play a file on a specific time slot, the uh, T-Media gateway will send a, an event to the SAS server and you'll see it in the call flow, not only the ISAP message on the CFS and the SIP message, but also the play that was done on the media gateway device. Uh, you can also see signaling capture if you're doing the signaling on the devices. We have, uh, we allow to do call recording, so it can be triggered from the CFS or we have some other tools that can be used as well uh, offline. And then we have uh, media capture. So you can, you can do a capture of all the VoIP traffic that is going through the system, and you'll be able to see that. So if you look at the uh, TSG signaling gateway, you can see that uh, on the front, there's not many connections. So you have a serial port that you can use to configure the system initially. But on the rear, you will see here that all the connections are here. So you have your 16 T1, E1 ports, which are here. All our G48C connectors here, it's similar to the RJ45. And then you have your gigabit per second port here, uh, management, uh, VoIP, and I will explain how that is used. You have a one plus one redundancy available. So each of the devices we have, we can do one plus one redundancy. Uh, I will talk about it just a little in this, these presentations. Uh, if you are interested to learn more, we can do other uh, trainings later. You have uh, your power supplies here. It's always dual power supply, but it's either AC or DC. And uh, well, yeah, like I said, it's always redundant. So if I go to the media gateway uh, version, I'm, I'm, I'm showing here uh, not the smallest version, but it's, it's the same as what we saw just before. Uh, the TMG3200 has support for up to 64 T1 or E1. It has some special connectors here, which go out to a patch panel like this. And then you have your RG48C connectors on this patch panel. Uh, you can have up to, uh, well, almost 2,000 simultaneous calls in the system. Uh, what I mean by this is voice over IP calls, RTP streams. So you can have this on the devices, and then the rest here is the same as the previous device. Then we have the DS3 model. So the DS3 has three interfaces, so RXTX three times here coaxial type connections. And then you have up to 2,000 simultaneous calls as well. So all the DS3 uh, TDM channels coming in can go out on the IP side. 
You can also cross a eh, uh, TDM to TDM or IP to IP on these devices. There's no, no problem doing that. Um, you have two other connectors here, which will I, I explain later for bits or uh, other applications. And then again, one plus one redundancy, redundant power supplies on these devices. The next model of TNG3200 is the OC3 STM1. So OC3 is more mostly North America, STM1 mostly rest of the world. And you have a protection. So one of them is your uh, main interface. And then you have another one, which is for protection. If something happens with one of the two fibers, it will automatically switch to the other one and uh, you won't lose any traffic. You have 2,000 calls on these devices. The little um, modules here are odd swappable. So it's possible to replace them if ever uh, you see a, a problem. For, uh, with my, our experience here, we, we've never had to replace any one of them, but uh, it could happen that some of them, but it's odd swappable. So you have this advantage here. And the uh, same thing here, so we'll, we'll go through this. The, all these uh, T-Media uh, Media Gateway supports different vocoders. I put the list here. So of course, the most popular is G711. And you have two modes, uh, ALA or MULA. Uh, and we can do the conversion be between the two modes. Uh, well, actually, we can do conversion between any of those modes here and, uh, and another. Uh, then we support uh, 723, 726, 729. Then we have uh, ILBC, GSM. And then AMR, narrow band, and the white band, which is G722.2. For these particular ones here, you need to uh, ask us for the license. We don't give uh, the permission to use those vocoders out of the box because you, we are not identified for those vocoders. So if, if you are, then very good. You can use those vocoders, and we'll give you the license. Um, it has echo cancellation on all channels. Uh, of course, there's a possibility for the uh, media gateway controller to disable the echo cancellation, but by default, it will always be on. And then we support uh, T38 for fax uh, and pass through for fax or mode. The management of these devices, either the media gateway or the signaling, signaling gateway is done from uh, different uh, angles. Uh, mostly the interface we'll be using is the web portal. So this gives you a, an interface, a browser interface that you can log into the system and configure each of the device, each of the modules and features separately into the system. And you have the status as well. So you can see all the status of all the elements in the system. So we can go there, configure the device, and then look at the status. Uh, and then if everything is okay, we don't need to use this web portal uh, later unless something goes down. Let's say one of the TDM links go down and it's reported by the uh, SNMP system. Here, you can go back to the web portal and verify which T1 link is down and try to fix it. The configuration can also be uh, done with our RISPL API. So we have already uh, some examples of doing this, and we will have a training specifically on how to use these RESTful API and configure the system. So the advantage of the RESTful API is that you can configure multiple devices uh, at the same time, uh, program with an application. So that means uh, maybe less chance of errors, and also, uh, you know, when you do a change, you can do a, the change on all your systems at the same time. This is optional. You then need to have uh, externally to the system, an uh, element management system, and then uh, we will be using SNMP for this. So the EMS can uh, send requests to the device to get some data on what is configured and what is the status. And then uh, we can send traps to the element management system. If something changes, we just send a, an event of uh, what has changed. And the, this can be shown in an alarm or as thresholds. Right? So we did integrate 
this with the um, uh, MVS, correct, Just right? MVS or MVE? MVS. MVE. MVE, sorry. So with the MVE of MetaSwitch, so you will you will be able to have this integrated if you want. We spent uh, some time in the recent uh, months to integrate the SaaS server. So again, when something is requested on the media gateway, we can send information to the SaaS here. So for example, if we uh, if it, there's a command that is sent to, like I said, play a file, uh, we can say, well, we played this file and the SaaS, you'll be able to trace it in the SaaS server. If you need to have more information, you can connect to the console. With the console, you have uh, some commands you can do on the device to see either status, configuration information, or do different types of uh, function. And uh, you can have also here uh, the signaling trace. So again, you need to connect to the console and get data of what is going on on the system. And I just wanted to mention the one plus one redundancy. Like I said, I'm not going to be explaining this into the uh, into this training, but uh, in in general, just to give you an idea how it works, you have uh, your device. One of them will be the primary device here, and then you will install a secondary device uh, the same way as the primary one, and interconnect them together like this. Uh, these are viewed from the external as one system. So you don't have two systems to control here. It's viewed as just one system. When the, when the uh, media gateway controller sends command, it sends to that system here. Then to be able to have the one plus one, we need to have a uh, one plus one patch panel here, which will uh, have the, let's say, the network connection come into the device, and this will be splitted amongst the two devices here. It can be any type of uh, device, uh, TDM link, I mean, E1, P1, DS3, OC3, and STM1 here. And it's, uh, this, this allows us to switch between the two devices here. So if we detect a problem on the primary device, the second one will take over. These are active standby. So only one of the two devices are carrying the traffic, and the other one is in standby. The patch panel here is a passive patch panel. So there's no, no power or, or uh, no, nothing here that can break on the system uh, with active components. The, on the, just to explain on the RTP side here, what we'll do is we'll uh, uh, give an IP to the one of the two systems, and the other one will have uh, no IP here. So as soon as something goes uh, wrong, it will take the IP of the primary system and reverse our peer to be able to uh, tell the network that we our IP has changed uh, location. Okay, so this is the overview. Do we have some questions on this presentation? I think I got them all answered, except the last one was if uh, the Opus codec is in our consideration or roadmap. You mean you, had, you, you rep replied in the chat? Yes, I did. Okay, well, I think we should still mention it here. So if you just okay. go through quickly, we can, uh, we can see that. So the first question was, do the transcoder units, the TMGIP, fall under the T-Media device category? Okay, I didn't talk about the TMGIP. So the TMGIP is um, one of these two devices, either a, a TMG-800 or a TMG-3200, in which we remove the TDM interfaces. So then it becomes an IP only uh, device. So it is a media gateway uh, without TDM interfaces. Okay. And the next question was, are there any documentation in PDFs? Uh, there is a few documentation in PDF. Uh, I mentioned quick start guides, data sheets, and basic installation guides. Is there anything? Correct. Else in? No, nope, okay. that's that's what we have. 
this uh, TB wiki here is available offline. So we do uh, sometimes a, a backup of the, uh, the wiki and you can get it. Uh, we can send you the link if you want to have that. Or you can just on your, on your site crawl it and you'll have all the documentation available. And one question I think you already answered later in your presentation was, can one configure T Media gateways via web interface? And I think you answered that. Correct, correct. So the basic, let's say the basic conf configuration mode is the web portal. So usually we start with that. Uh, so yes, it's available. And then you have other ways to configure the system uh, like the RESTful API, for example. And then the, the question on a high level, What's the biggest difference between the media gateway and the signaling gateway? Well, um, if I think My answer this, was DSPs. Yes. Yeah, well, R, the RTP encoding, there's yeah, there's a lot of differences. <laughs> it's, so um, so it's a different process in the system completely, right? Here we we extract signaling information out of these TDM channel. We we let's say for example MTP two, there's like a, um, buffers between the messages and and uh, physios and stuff like that. So we just extract the important information from the MTP tooling, put it into a and to UA encapsulation. So it's, it's mostly processor function, okay? So CPU processing. Uh, if you look at the media gateway part, well, the H248 is CPU processing. So decoding what is the message and what we need to do with it. And then on the uh, media side, we have to get the 64 kilobit per second time slot of information, which is coming in steadily into the system. And then we packetize it in a, a, a buffer that is sent using IP. So of course, to be efficient on IP, you need to put a bit more uh, uh, bytes into that message. And then we can uh, code this uh, voice to be more efficient, okay? And one of the thing we have seen is that normally people don't want to vocode it. So they use just G711. If you have enough bandwidth on your network, there's no reason to uh, do vocoding, but there's some networks that require uh, lower bandwidth. So then we can go to uh, things like G729, or if you come from cellular networks, then maybe you're already encoded AMR. So you want to keep this AMR encoding to the network. And okay, so the other question was, do we support Opus? Yep. and uh, silk so opus and silk here are not supported in this device and um paul was asking about the impact of a failure in a one plus one uh what happens to the active calls right so in a h248 scenario where uh, it's the media gateway control that has the uh, logic of all the calls there will be uh, no loss of uh, no loss of calls in a switchover between primary and secondary. There will be a, a short period of time while the secondary takes over a few seconds where uh, the, the traffic will need to be uh, resent here. So in a few seconds, you will be have a shortcut, but then it, it's gonna uh, catch up again and no loss of calls on these types of uh, switchover. And Chris Liu is asking uh, about sick, uh, signaling to the meta switch. So in our lab, I have one unit set up as an H248 uh, media gateway, and I have one lab set up as a SIP trunk, and everything from the SIP trunk is working without problem. Oh, uh, Joshua, thank you for that. So yeah, my question was, so the this gateway we support using SIP talking to CFS, in addition to the H248, correct? Yep, both okay. of them are supported. To Perfect. get all yeah, of the uh, meta switch features, you'll want to use H248, but if that's not your application and you just need a SIP correct. trunk, there's no problem. Okay, so in that SIP model, uh, inside the gateways, we can do some uh, dial plans, translations, or 
Right. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. That's my question. And Chris, this can co cohabit, right? Meaning that you can have your signaling gateway here. You could have your uh, media gateway here. Plus, if you need to have, and we've done it before in some cases where uh, uh, some of the protocols may not be supported by the H248 media gateway controller, we can terminate SIP on those specific T1s uh, to support this specific uh, function. Okay, so uh, it's, it's also possible to do that, mix and match the okay. configurations, yes. And that's perfect, thank you. Very flexible. <laughs> cool. Um, and, oh, go ahead, Conrad. Yes, yeah, sorry, I wanted to ask, um, during the training, will we, um, I think Joshua will probably show us, is there going to be some sort of integration with the Pro SBC, uh, integrating the S Media Gateway? So let's say for an example, I'm having a TDM network, which will obviously, for which I'll use the Media Gateway, is there some sort of integration module that between the Media Gateway and the Pro SBC? Good, uh, good question. And and when we started this Pro SBC project uh, six years ago, initially we decided to uh, use the media gateway with what was not called the Pro SBC at the time, but the SBC functionality inside the media gateway. Uh, we faced some limitations of of performance capacity, and in the end, we decided not to do this anymore. So. What we do now is if you want to have a media gateway and the SBC functionality, we need to put both devices into your network. So you have your media gateway, which has your TDM interconnection, and you can go out SIP. And then you have the Pro SBC in front, which you can send the traffic to the Pro SBC and be able to interconnect to the rest of the, of the world. All right, cool. Thanks. So okay. if you are... If, if the IP network has an SBC, it can be pro SBC as well. Yep, correct. Oh. Absolutely here. And, and mm -hmm. just to tell you, MetaSwitch does the same, right? So they have their media gateway controller and they put a, uh, their, their uh, SBC here in front to, to face the SIP network because it's, it's, it's a specialized function to be able to uh, um, analyze all the SIP traffic that is coming into the network and make sure that you don't have any unwanted traffic coming in. So it, it's, it's much more efficient to have a separate function concentrated on this in the network. Okay, thank you. That's all for my side. So uh, Arwood was asking for clarification on the, uh, the cutover in the event of a failure. He was asking if you meant millisecond or microsecond. And I was explaining that you, when you said multiple seconds, you were talking about the most severe case of a complete outage TDM hardware. Um, yes, 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 if, correct, correct. If just an app fails on one of the devices, the secondary is going to take over running that app without, uh, without the customer noticing anything. Uh, Luke was talking about the the most dire case imaginable. Correct, correct. So, so yes, if it's only applications uh, that has a problem, it will just take over super fast. Uh, you don't, you don't notice it uh, in the system. So, uh, correct. Do you know the exact time if if it's a full hardware outage uh, for the for the cutover? I've got some tests scheduled this week on that, so yeah. I might be able to get a more specific answer. But I don't yeah, know if we'll, you know off the top of your head. These were done uh, some time ago, so uh, I'm I'm thinking probably four or five seconds, something like that. Uh, but uh, yeah, so different types of failures would have more or less delays, but uh, it's, it's approximately in that range. All right. Any more questions in the list? Um, uh, Dave, I think he just wanted clarification about the calls in progress. So the calls in progress on a failure will stay connected. Perfect. Uh, in the most extreme situation, there will be several seconds of dead air. In a more minor failure, uh, the customer will not, or the, the user on the phone will not notice anything. And then I think that's, yeah, that's everything. Okay, super.
So let's move on to the next one. Installation of the devices. So this is the hardware installation. Yeah, this is Bill Mullins before we move on. So you all keep saying seconds. I mean, in the uh, SIP world and stuff, that's like a moment. I mean, that's a long time, right? I mean, our... We're not we're not talking seconds because this is an H two forty. I'm sorry, we're not talking SIP um because uh, this is an H two forty eight control gateway. Right. This communication is still going to be going to the the meta switch. Uh, we're talking about when the system needs to bring basically reallocate chips on the secondary device and bring them on for the uh, the existence, and that's where the the dead air is. the SIP okay. communication will remain yeah. unbroken because the CFS will handle that. And I don't know the CFS's uh, switch over time to be honest. Okay, it just seemed like a long time, but okay, cool. Thank you. Just to um, ju just to mention this, I, I the the PNG seventy eight hundred systems. We have done some uh, improvements on the on the switch over time, and it's very short. And I am trying to remember: is it one second or something like that? It's it's very very short to uh, to switch. The TMC seven hundred works just slightly differently, and we've been able to improve the uh, the switch over time in case something happens. So uh, uh, so we, we we can just some room for for improvement. That's for sure. Right. And we are once again talking about the most dire failover possible <laughs> in our system. But most of the things that, that come mm. won't be noticed at all. Now, if we're talking about voice, when we're losing the voice communication on the uh, uh, TNGs there, if you're sitting on the phone and you're talking to someone and you've got two seconds of silence, what are you going to do? You're going to hang up. Also, if it's, it's got uh, uh, several if it's got DS3s in it and you come up and you've got a two second loss, that's considered a, a Federal Communications Commission outage and has to be reported. That's more paperwork for the telco. Are you sure on this when you've got a hardware issue with TNG? If it switches, it takes one or two seconds. Because if you do, that's that's not really good. Well, yeah, that's that's what we have right now with the TMG 3200 devices. So it's it's uh, a few seconds of of uh, of uh, communication drop uh, in in a switchover. If you're like most people, two seconds of silence, you're going to hang up. Is that not correct? I mean, honestly, I can barely get out. Can you still hear me in a second and a half? So then I would probably <laughs> wait a second for them to respond to that. And then I would ask it a second time. <laughs> Very good. I think we can have this discussion <laughs> over a beer. <laughs> or two. <laughs> And as as Luke mentioned on our on our seventy eight TMG seventy eight hundred the stack unit with the uh, the N plus one redundancy it's significantly faster. All right. Okay, very good. Let's continue here with the installation. So I want to show the TSG eight hundred. You saw it a little bit before, and the TMG thirty two hundred. So I'm focusing on these devices. Uh, we would have other other presentation on the other devices. Uh, physical view, patch panel, connections, installation steps, and the initial configuration. So I've shown the uh, front of the devices here. You have an old RS-232 type connection uh, that you can uh, connect to the device here, or a USB serial connection as well here, so you can connect to the device. And the only reason you want to connect here on the serial port is to give it a, a management IP. Uh, like we were, were talking uh, the other day is that this, this device comes with a default IP. So you have the choice to uh, connect from the management port to the default IP to be able to uh, change that management IP on your network. Or if you, don't, if you can't do that, then you can connect with these serial ports here. There's also a small button here that you can uh, shut down the system. It's a little bit recessed, so it's, uh, you need to have a pin to be able to uh, do that. Of course, normally we don't need to uh, do these types of shutdown. 
Uh, I've shown you the rear here just a bit more in detail. There's 16 T1 or E1 interface. Each of the ports are individually configurable on any one of those modes. Then you have uh, in, in here uh, two management ports. Well, you can see it here. The two management ports that you have, uh, two Ethernet ports. So these are used for connecting to the redundant device in the one plus one uh, architecture. So we saw that in the previous presentation. And here you have two voice over IP ports, which are uh, used for uh, many things, uh, including the RTP traffic, plus the sync, sync traffic, and it can also be used for H248. Okay, so we could we could use different ports, but, but normally we use the same two ports for these types of traffic. And we uh, can they can be on different VLANs and different IPs on those networks. And you see the power supplies here, the yeah, 16 interfaces. The TMG3200, the front view is the same. The rear view here, you have uh, small differences. One is there's one management port here. So one, I would say, in independent management port. Uh, it is possible to configure additional management ports going to those devices, VoIP 0, VoIP 1, if you want to have redundancy. Okay, but let's say the default management port to get into the system the first time, there's only one port here. Uh, you have then two Ethernet ports here. This is for the one plus one configuration. So these are connected straight to the uh, secondary system. And then you have two voice over IP ports, which are here, which can, I just, as I just explained, uh, being you, be used for RTP, um, uh, SIGTRAN, and also H24. In a um, TMG3200, installation, we will not use the two ports here, TMS0 and TMS1. Uh, they, are, they are only used in a TMG7800, so the larger system, and this is used to interconnect the media uh, between the devices. Right? So it's possible to get all the media out of these two ports here, and these are uh, low delay ports, so it's very efficient. In the TMG3200, we don't use these two parts. And then you have your TDM interfaces. The way it works is you have uh, four connectors. Each one of them have 16 uh, T1s on these ports. So these cables are uh, something like this, right? So you have your uh, SCSI cables like this, and they are connected between the T-media rear that we just saw, and the patch panel here. So you will connect one of the SCSI cable here and the other SCSI cable here. This will give you 32 uh, ports on the patch panel. And if you have uh, 64, then you will need two of these patch panel to allow to have 64 ports in total. Then you have the OC3 version of the device. So you have all of these parts are exactly the same on these, on these units. It's only the TDM part that changes here. You have your main OC3 port that is here and you have your protection port that is here. In this case, if there's a failover between the two, it, this is uh, instantaneous, right? So if there's a failure, automatically all the traffic will go on the second one if both of them are connected. Like I mentioned just before, these transceivers are outswappable. You see the little blue thing here? You can just pull it down and take out the, uh, the transceiver here. Uh, the default connections are uh, SMF uh, fiber, single mode fiber, 13, 10 nanometer, and LC connector. It's possible to have other types of connectors if you need to. There's also here on the left side two, we call them bit ports. And these two bit ports, these two bits ports are used for synchronization. So they can be connected to a bits 
timing source, or they can be used for other function. For example, you could have some signaling links coming in in here. For example, if you have your uh, OC3 connection here with your media, and your signaling links do not come in this OC3, and they come in specific T1s, then you could connect your T1s here with your signaling channel, and they can be uh, used uh, in a SIGTRAN relay mode. And you have two of those ports here that can be used uh, in this configuration. And also, well, one of them can be used for synchronization, and one of them can be used for signaling links, or, uh, there are, or both of them can be used for any function. Then you have the DS3 model. So you see here port zero, RX, TX. So you have uh, two connectors for each of the DS3, up to three DS3. It gives you, again, 2,000 channel per device. You have your two bits port here on the left side that can be used the same way as the OC3 version. I've been, all my, my previous uh, snapshots have been uh, AC connections. So here I show the uh, DC connections. So you have your uh, plus and minus and the ground pins here. There's also a ground pin here that should always be connected if it's possible to do that. So, uh, so uh, it's uh, all of the devices, TSG, TMG, can be configured to have those uh, power supplies. On the uh, TSG-800, if I show just the basic connections that we have, the ones we want to use, you have the uh, management interfaces. Here you have two management interfaces, MGMT-0 and MGMT-1. MGMT-1 is optional. Both of them are configured by default in bonding and will have the same uh, IP address. So you can use this. You have your 16 T1E1 on a TSG-800. They connect directly on the ports of the uh, TSG-800. And these will be connecting to uh, legacy switches, PSTN network, anything that can bring in the uh, SS7 uh, MPP toolings here. Then these will be converted towards the Metaswitch EFS, Media Gateway Controller, uh, as SIGTRAN M2 UA. Uh, here on this side, we have two ports, VoIP 0 and VoIP 1. In general, we configure them in bonding, and it can be on, uh, configured on any VLANs and any IP interface. So we will be uh, explaining this uh, later on this week, how to configure these ports. Then we have the TMG3200. TE version, so that's a T1, E1 version. Here, as you saw previously, there's only a man one management port, so management zero here. So you can connect it to uh, be able to access this web interface and be able to configure the system. On the TDM side here, you have up to 64 T1, E1 that you want to connect to the PSTN. Here I didn't show, but you have the patch panel here that uh, you need to have to connect to the PSTN. Um, on the voice of IP side or IP side, you will have uh, your H248 connection that usually are in bonding on VoIP 0 and VoIP 1. And uh, also you have your RTP here, which could be on a different IP interface, different VLAN, but using the same VoIP, VoIP ports. I explained also that you can have a management interface using those two VoIP ports if you want to have redundancy. So it's possible, possible to have this. If you have also the uh, M2UA connection, as you saw here in the previous slide of the TSG-800, if you want to have to M2UA, then you can also have this here, the M2UA connection uh, on the uh, same voice or IP ports. Here you also have the same uh, TMG3200, but now it's an OC3 version. You have your management port to configure the system, your 
TDM channel here, well, it's a bit simpler with OC2. You have only two, two connections to do. Uh, well, actually, APS is optional here, so you can have only one connection to the network. And then you have your H248 and RTP, just the same way as the previous system. You can also have your M2 UA here, so it is optional. And the last model is the DS3. Here you will have three DS3 connections. The DS3 connections, uh, well, you need two cables per uh, DS3, so you will have one going one way and one going the other way here. So you will have six connections on this side and uh, uh, same thing on the IP side. So that's the eye level view. Then I'm showing just a bit more in details what it, what it looks like so that when you get on site, uh, you see what it looks like. So I, we put here the, uh, the steps to do in, a, in a, something like this here. So you have first install the unit in the rack. So you have to put this device, all of them you saw have bracket to put in a 19 inch rack. And uh, you need to connect here the power, either the AC or the DC power, plus the uh, grounding pin here to make sure everything is at the right level. Um, next, you need to connect your IP interfaces. Right? So you need at least to have one management interface here, so management zero. Uh, if you're in a standalone mode, you don't need to connect these two ETH ports. And you need to connect your at least one voice of IP ports. But of course, normally we have the two voice of IP ports. If it can be on different switches or or redundant internal redundant switches, it's it's better. So the management one again is optional. So in fact, you need to connect three, uh, three, three at least three connections: management zero, VoIP zero, and VoIP one. Uh, you need to connect your TDM. So here on the TSG800, the connections are straight on the T1. So you have each of the T1s that connect to the devices here like this. Then uh, to be able to reach the management interface, you need to give it an IP address. So either you use the default IP that is uh, used when we ship it, or you connect with a serial port so you can put a a laptop or something to connect to the serial port. I will show you uh, in a minute how to do that. And that will allow you to configure the management IP. To configure the management IP, it's one command on the system. It's called TB change IP, like Teco Bridges change IP. And then this allows you to configure your initial IP for the system. Once you have your management IP on the system, then you can reach the web interface. And then when you reach the web interface the first time, it will ask you in what mode are you? Are you in a standalone configuration or are you in a one plus one configuration? So then uh, you can just answer this. Once that is done, you can start configuring your device. And this we will show in the next uh, presentations how to do that. And here I show you the TMG 3264T1E1 version. So if I look at the uh, process here, install the unit in the rack, connect the power, AC or DC, connect the IP network. So the IP network, you will have one management port, one VoIP port, and another VoIP port here. So you need to have three, three ports. The ETH0, ETH1 are not connected. The TMS, even if they're not IP ports, are also not connected here. You need to connect the TDM ports. The TDM ports will have four, up to four SCSI cables. Each one of them will be connected to one or the other of the two patch panel. Uh, so each of the cables here support 16 T1E1 and the patch panel support 32 T1E1. And all of them will be connected to the uh, equipment that we need to interconnect here on the TDM side. You still need to connect your device to the serial port to allow you to configure the management IP. Plus, configure the host role. In this case, it's going to be also standalone mode. And then we can configure that device. For other 
PNG devices, let's say the OC3, well, all the IP connections are the same. The only thing that will change is the uh, TDM connection. So you will have your main port for OC3 here and your optional APS port here. Plus, if you need to have your synchronization coming from the uh, building clock here, you can uh, connect them here. Then you have the DS3 connections, and here I changed a little bit just to show what, what would be a one plus one installation. So on the, uh, let's say we start the process, install units in rack. So now you will have two units to install in rack plus the one plus one patch panel. Then you need to connect the power of this device and this device, connect the IP, you will have two independent management so it's possible to reach each of the devices separately even if when you configure the system it doesn't matter which one you connect to both of them will be uh, in the same view as just one system you need to connect your VoIP 0 VoIP 1 ports of both devices and they need here what you have to be careful if they need to be on the same networks right so they need to have the same VLANs available on the network uh, and the same subnets, okay, to be reachable. Uh, if if there's a switchover between one the one port to the other port here, it needs to be uh, reachable from the network. Okay, so just have to make sure of that. And the other thing we need to do when you use a one plus one is you need to connect ETH zero and ETH one port straight between. Whoops, straight between the devices like this, up and down. And uh, this will have communication between them to make sure uh, to, to decide who is the master and make sure there's a, always synchronization of the configuration going on. So you need, and then you need to connect the TDM port. So here you will have your uh, main, main port here connected to one here. Your secondary and your network will be connected here right so you will have three connections uh, for each of the ds3 and uh, you see you also have on the uh, patch panel your bits port so your so your bits connection or your your signaling links that you have that you are using that are will need to be connected here on the uh, bits port and they will be forwarded to the bits port here so we, the patch panel also supports these uh, bits, uh, bits uh, links. And uh, here, like I mentioned before, these are passive uh, patch panels, so they don't need any power connected to them. Um, you will need to configure a management IP for both systems, so they will have the same, uh, a different management port. But it's also possible later to, to have another management IP that will connect to VoIP 0, VoIP 1, and they could have the same, could have the same IP if you want and be redundant. So it's possible to configure that. Uh, the host role here, well, the difference in a one plus one system is that you will uh, configure one of the unit as a primary unit and one of your unit as a secondary unit. And it doesn't really matter who is primary, secondary in 99% in of the, of the cases. It's, uh, it's just to uh, make sure who, who will have like the master database into the system. So the, uh, to, to be able to configure the management IP, you need to have console access. The way to get console access is either with uh, your serial port with a dongle that I will show you in the next slide or USB. All right? So USB, very simple. You just connect the USB uh, on the device and on your, uh, on your laptop and it's detected as a serial port. So it's easy to access it with that as well. Uh, you can then uh, connect with a serial uh, uh, application like putty or something like that and then once you connect to the serial port uh, the default access will be uh, user root and the password will be the serial number of the device 
uh, followed by PW star. So for example, if you have this serial number, this will be uh, your password. Okay, so it's it's a different password for each device for a, a slight a security of the system. Once you have connected to the device, then you can set the management IP, subnet and gateway of the, of the device so that it can be reachable by the management ports. And to do this, you can use the tool that's called TB change IP. It's a very simple tool that just gives you, uh, ask you for the, the IP. You can also use the HTTP if you want, but most likely it's static IP and you can put all the information for uh, your configuration here. Uh, <clears throat> if you are not using the USB port and you want to have the serial port access, well, you saw probably on the, on the device, the connection on the unit is not a DB9. So it's really a, a RJ45 jack but we have a converter from the RJ45 to the DB9. And then depending on what type of system uh, you are using, you will need one of those two cables here to connect. And uh, most likely it will be this one, but it's not provided in the shipments, but these dongles and these cables are provided when the equipments are shipped. Right, so you can use to, to, to connect with this, which requires a few cables, and sometimes it's difficult to find. With USB, very simple, or you can connect directly to the default management IP, uh, which I did not mention, but I will give you uh, later. Once you've configured your management IP uh, with TB change IP command, the uh, network service will be restarted and automatically you will then be able to reach the system. To reach the system, the default will be your management IP that you just configured on the system. And uh, you need to put the port 12358. So it's gonna be HTTP, management IP, column 12358. There's no user password when you get them the first time on the interface. You get to this page, you have a, a uh, initial page that tells you uh, what serial number you have, what type of device you have, and it will say, it will present you what this unit can be, okay? Standalone, primary, or secondary. You can just type on continue here. If you are using a standalone unit, you just need to uh, click on as a standalone unit, continue, and this will be a device by itself like this, right? If you want a one plus one system, then you will need to uh, put as part of a one plus one redundant system and you will need to say which one is primary and which one is secondary. If you just choose uh, all these, uh, if you just answer these questions, then it's gonna ask you, and confirm, are you a standalone? Here it shows primary, so this uh, could be secondary as well. Uh, and then uh, in between the two devices, you know, you saw we connected ETH0, ETH1, and normally it's connected directly, so it doesn't matter which VLANs will be used for interconnection between the two devices. But if ever, for some reason, you want to change those VLAN, it's possible in this initial configuration to change them. So, but if you use standalone, you just say uh, continue. It's gonna take a few minutes, few seconds, few minutes to uh, configure the default uh, web portal. And then you will get to the, uh, this interface again. Uh, by default, it's gonna be the same management IP and port that you will need to connect here to access the web portal. And there will be a default user and password of root root that you will need to put here. Okay. This uh, interface here, HTTP, can be changed to HTTPS uh, later in the configuration. And also the port here can be changed if you uh, don't want to use this. When you get into the system the first time, you will get to like the welcome page. And uh, the welcome page shows you uh, a few information, how many calls are currently active in the system. Uh, when it was, uh, what is the system date? When was it started the last time? And, and a few, what version it's running? A few information here. You see the version up here also. 
And, and uh, if you are connected to uh, on a one plus one system, it's going to show you if you're on a primary or secondary. But again, it doesn't change much uh, to know that. It's just shown here. Once you get in this page the first time, you need to ask yourself a few, configure, uh, a few questions. Should I upgrade the system to a new version? So maybe uh, the system that uh, the version that was installed on the, the, ver the system at shipping time is not the one that you're using in your uh, network at this time. So maybe you want to upgrade the system to a new version. If you already have a, a, a configuration done of a system which is very similar to this one, it's possible to upload a database backup into the system and it's going to give you a framework for configuration of the system. So you can just load your database, activate it, and then you have uh, uh, the same system as another one, and then you can just modify uh, the things you want. Alternatively, you can use the RESTful API to upload the configuration, and this we will talk about it uh, later in these trainings. And we will, uh, you can have some configuration files or, or configuration applications and be push this configuration to the system. Or you can just start doing a manual configuration, depending if it's a TSG 800, it could be very quick to do a, a manual configuration or a T, uh, T Media Gateway, which could take a bit more for renaming, naming convention. And So then once you've done that, you're ready to uh, start using the system. Did we get any questions? Yep, and we've got a couple that I wasn't able to answer. There you go. Um, so the bits stratum level, I'm guessing it's stratum level three, but I wasn't certain. Do you know off the top of your head? Correct. So the, let me just go to a slide which has the bits parts here. Oops, the bits part here. Okay, so inside the device, there is a local oscillator. Okay, there's an oscillator to get a, a clock on the system. This clock is stratum 3E. Okay, the internal clock is stratum 3. So it's, it's relatively good, but not enough for a, 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 real, a real network. Uh, so it's enough to keep the synchronization going and the OC3 will not drop, the T1s will not drop, but you may have some frame slip sometimes. If you want to be totally safe, then you need to use the bits part. Uh, then you can have a sort of one, two, depending on, on the quality of your, uh, of your bits part. And Paul followed up that question with, can we pull bits from a T1? Correct, yes, yes. A T1 can have uh, the bits because there's there's a different um, configuration of the bits part. Uh, for us, it needs to be a T1, and I think there's another one that's called like square wave or something like that. So we don't support the square wave uh, type. Yeah. And uh, a couple questions. Oh, oh, oh wait, 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 wait. Okay. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I didn't answer that perfectly. So, so the question may be that. For example, on a TSG 800, you don't have a bits port. So it's possible to take one of those ports to get a bits clock inside, inside the system as well. Okay, so maybe that was the question. Uh, okay. Um, and uh, do you know the length of the SCSI cables? Are they a meter and a half? Yeah, we were supposed to check that, right? <laughs> it's yeah, that about this size, right? I, I don't remember. We can we can come back with that. The 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 SCSI cables to clarify are just a safe uh, a space saving mechanism essentially to go from our sixty four RJ forty eight the actual unit to these patch panels you see on the screen now. The best practice the idea is for these patch panels to be mounted directly above or below your TMG thirty two hundred in the case that you need uh, all sixty four RJ forty eights. Um, it's a proprietary pinout that we're using to bring it over, and it's it's more coincidental that we're using a SCSI cable than a part of that uh, that physical register jack. So this is 
kind of just making it more flexible into the installations and uh the goal or the idea is that you mount the patch panels above your tmg 3200 and you handle the rj 48s you handle you run your lines with rj 48s correct it's it is possible i know it is possible to get longer scuzzy cables than the default that we are shipping but we 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 can search for this answer and, and let you know and that was another question. Are different lengths available? So it is possible. <laughs> um, yes. where we got the stratum level. Okay, so there was a question about using the one plus one protection feature on a single TMG thirty two hundred. And is it possible to run two TMG thirty two hundreds and one plus one with a single fiber each? So I wrote this answer in chat as well. But the um, on a single TMG thirty two hundred, the protection is the APS, the automatic protection switching. Um, already in the the, the Sonnet um, standards. When we say one plus one, we're always talking about two TMG 3200s, like this picture right here with the DS3s. So in an STM1 or an OC3 setup, you would have your STM1 running to this patch panel and your APS protection. And then that patch panel would run two fiber lines to each TMG 3200. So earlier before, when we were talking about multiple seconds of dead air, we were not talking about an APS switchover of an STM1 or an OC3 failure. We were talking about two TMG 3200s and one of them having an absolute hardware halting catastrophic failure. Um, the APS transition is going to be much, much quicker than what we're covering. Um, okay. Yeah, so let me just show Joshua before you move on. Uh, okay. The one, the S, you, you saw, the one I showed is the DS3 one plus one patch panel, which is like this. So you have your three DS3s uh, to the network, three DS3 to the primary, three DS3 to the secondary. But the one plus one patch panel for STM1 is you have uh, one main and an APS to the network main to the gate, to the gateway, which is like the primary and gateway plus one is the secondary. You don't need to use the APS in this case, right? It could be just one, one, one main. And this is the one plus one patch panel for the uh, T1E1. Okay, so you connect 32 ports to the primary, 32 ports to the secondary, and then you have your 32 ports going to the network. Is that clear? And we've got a, a power question. Are the AC grounds isolated from the DC slash chassis ground? That's yes, the, right? AC grounds? Yeah, on the power supply. Uh, I will, they, would, they would need to be isolated from the chassis ground, right? I would need, I don't remember. Okay. Don't remember. So you mean this, will, this power, this ground and it. this ground? Is that what we're talking about? Okay. I believe, um, let me look up who asked that question. Uh, Darren, you asked that question. Is that, yes, that's easy sending it in chat. Um, so that is his question. Is that chassis ground bolt and the, uh, the AC? I believe they're isolated, but we can confirm. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember. So I believe so, Darren, but we will follow up. And um, when we're, we're done this training, I'm typing down every question and we'll send the questions and answers out to the attendees. So we'll, we'll make sure that you get this answer, Darren. Uh, and then Jim has a question about bits that I don't know if I completely understand. Uh, so Jim said, currently using primary and secondary bits clock inputs in my existing meta gateway. Is there a connection for these in the TMG 3200 with a configuring for the 32 T1s? So can we use one of the T1s on yes. the TMG 3200? I think T1? that's the question and I, the okay. answer is yes. Okay. If, I, if I understood you right, Jim, yes, you can isolate specific ones of your T1s to use as bits clocks. And your existing T1s, yes, they would stay the same. And we had a question about TMG3200 being integrated with Metaswitch IMS. I know the IMS supports H248, but I don't really know the difference between that and the CFS. So I might need to check with uh, the Metaswitch team on that one. I don't know the answer. 
Okay, so I will uh, I will check with the Nintendo Switch team on the IMS and see if they anticipate any lack of functionality there. But it is an H two forty eight Media Gateway controller as well, and our H two forty eight stack was developed vendor agnostic originally, and we've added on features uh, specific to the Meta Switch CFS. So uh, my my gut feeling is yes, but I'll confirm that one as well. And some talks about redundancy we did. Uh, David asked, is the management a Unix-based server or is it direct connect to the TSG from your PC? So correct, right? Oh, go ahead. Yep. Yeah, go so, ahead. so the um, inside the device, and we will we will show you this when we get more in the troubleshooting section because you need to understand a bit how it works internally. But the management connection and the serial connection gets to an internal server which is running a Linux CentOS seven uh, operating system. And all the high layer applications are running there, like the H two forty eight stack and 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 SNMP and and the web portal. So they're running at this. And then you have a second portion on the system, which is the telecom interfaces, which has the TDM lines, the DSPs, the VoIP ports, uh, the the signaling CPU. Uh, so these are all in the second system. So I'm trying to remember the question. Was it specifically? Does it connect to a Linux? Yes, that yeah, there was so, the management done. So there's a real time operating system running on everything that's handling TDM and media. And then there's a Unix server that a Linux CentOS 7 that's handling all the configuration and configures that real time operating system as well to make it transparent to uh, the, the user. So um, what you're connecting to, like if you're using our web GUI or if you're using our API is a CentOS 7 box running a web server with our web GUI on it. Um, and then R would ask another question that I think we're going to have to find in your slides. He said, when Luke showed the screen after logging into the box via GUI, it showed lines. Did you mean SS7 trunks? Lines go to subscribers and trunks between systems. So um, sure where's your slide where you log into the GUI? Oh. Did this one? I would or... assume so. Or this one, maybe this one, I, right? I think it's uh, the the confusion between that is just because when you're when you're in that screen, the system doesn't know whether you're going to set up PRIs or SS7 links or anything like that. So my guess is if an, it's an SS7 scenario, it would be trunk specifically, and we were just using lines as a catch-all phrase. Uh, and then he asked, he re-clarified the question while we were talking about it. When Luke says lines, does he mean to individual subscribers or to uh, to trunks between systems? We're using it to mean either one because the configuration could be different. 